On this show, we're driven by curiosity. We want to chart a path forward. Best people, best conversations. We're on a journey and it's just getting started. All right, everybody, we are back. We are live. I am Jack Murphy. This is the Jack Murphy Live Show, and we are here today with the one and only Professor Larry Schweikert from the wild world of history. How you doing, Larry? I'm good. I'm great. I'm great too. Thanks for thanks for asking. <laughs> uh, I'm really happy to have you on the show, America. I want to hear your your story on COVID. So you told me to keep that out of that. So I'm oh, good. Right Man, we're already talking about COVID. That's hilarious. A lot of good that pregame talk did. Yeah, I can see how this one's. I can see how this one is going to go with America's history professor Larry Schweiker. I got a book of yours that I really enjoyed, and I've been thumbing through this big, massive masterpiece, A Patriot's History of the United States. I believe it is in something like this is the fifteenth anniversary edition, like thirty different editions in print. Congratulations on that, sir. This is a tremendous resource. If you don't have it, guys, go out there and get it. It's easy to read, and there is the whole story from beginning to now, uh, told in a very easily digestible way with lots of uh, great stories and immense backup and support. Larry, can you just give everybody a quick background on you so they know why we're talking to you? Uh, it will be obvious, I think, as soon as, as, soon as people hear. I want to know why you're talking to me, but <laughs> Get out of here. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm an Arizona native and uh, I went to Arizona State for a uh, BA in political science and I had horrible grades. Uh, parents, uh, you know, close your ears. Kids, you don't need good grades to succeed. OK, um, I was playing rock and roll all the way through high school and, and college and literally the weekend i graduated i was on in a van on my way to peoria illinois we played peoria illinois and i was on the road for the next several years and we we ended up opening for groups like savoy brown steppenwolf the james gang hung out with the allman brothers uh got our records on k100 radio reviewed by billboard cashbox record world uh but we came that close and then just didn't quite make it and I decided I wanted uh, an easy daytime gig <laughs> so I could still play rock and roll at night. And I thought teaching would be easy, right? And I had a degree in political science. So I, I had to go back to get a teaching certificate. And they said, well, you lack a course in U.S. history. Here I had a degree from a major American university in political science, and I hadn't had a course in U.S. history. Wow. So I went back in the summer of 76, I think, had a six week summer class that literally changed my life. I had uh, Professor Robert J. Lowenberg, uh, who was one of the three geniuses I've met in my life. And, and he started talking about um, von Hayek and von Mises and, and uh, Milton Friedman and uh, uh, Leo Strauss and Harry Jaffa and all these other people. I mean, who the heck are these people? And within two weeks, I go, I want to be that guy. So I rearranged my life, started graduate school in history. Did I mention I had bad grades? Yeah, you mentioned uh, that. Me too, guys. They had me to let me in provisionally because my grades are so bad. And uh, eventually I got an MA from Arizona State. They kicked me out. I ended up going to um, Santa Barbara because uh, it was a better school. They, they wanted me to go to a school where I could get a job. And I uh, got a PhD from Cal Santa Barbara and taught at the University of Dayton for 31 years. And here I am. Wow. Impressive. A whole lifetime's work, uh, certainly recorded and out there. If you haven't checked it out, make sure you guys go to wild world of history. You can follow Larry at history underscore wild. Also check it out. Wild world of history.com. Lots of resources there, homeschooling information, current media, all kinds of stuff, books. You can get everything you need to know about Larry over there. Head on over and check it out. We're going to get right into it, sir. Uh, as I was talking to you on the show beforehand, uh, I am going out to Nevada next week uh, to do a week-long fellowship with the Claremont Institute where we're going to study the founding and Abraham Lincoln and the current culture wars and the battle of the two constitutions that are ongoing here in the United States. And I've been doing a ton of reading, guys. Brian, 
<laughs> Arthur, thank you so much for the <laughs> the reading list. They literally sent me a box of books that is like about this big. There's about 30 hardcover pieces in there. And then also a uh, a printed out bound book of journals and essays, another like four <laughs> inches of reading. So I have been immersed in uh, the founders, original documents, the discussions around the founding. Uh, what was the intention of the founders and the revolutionaries at that time? Where were they going? And there's been a lot of questions in my mind, and I want to ask you your perspective on a number of them. But the first thing I want to talk about is the is the four pillars of exceptionalism as laid out in your book, A Patriot's History of the United States. And then we're going to drill down on one of them in particular. So let's start with that. What are what are the four pillars of American exceptionalism? Well, when Mike Allen and I first wrote Patriot's History, uh, we started around 1999. And our intention was to create a book that he and I could use in teaching our classes. We never thought it would go beyond that. In fact, we thought we were going to have to go to FedEx and get it, you know, <laughs> stapled and bound up, sell it out of the back of a van along with like plastic straws, you know, buddy, plastic straws, Patriots history of the United States. Right. But uh, we got a publisher and, and it uh, did pretty well. What I noticed when I started work on a book about six years later called Patriots History of the Modern World with Dave Doherty, he said, you know, you guys did not really give a very good explanation in your first edition of American exceptionalism. I, I thought about that, I go, you know, you're right. Uh, we looked at that. So Dave and I uh, spent a long time trying to figure out exactly what it was that made America exceptional. And what we came up with is called the four pillars of American exceptionalism. And it's important to understand this is from our founding. No other nation in history has had these four things from its founding. Most nations didn't have the first two I'm going to give you. So the first one is um, America was born with a Christian, mostly Protestant religious tradition. Now, the reason that is important is not for matters of theology. It's important because the Puritans and pilgrims who came over uh, were uh, congregational in their church governance, which is to say they were bottom up in church governance. No other religion in the world at that time was bottom up in church governance except for Protestants and specifically the Puritans and, and the Pilgrims. So right away, that alone would have made America exceptional. But it's reinforced by the second pillar, which is common law, which comes over from the Germans to the English to America. And uh, the, the Germanic tribes who were not Christian uh, believe that their gods put the law in the hearts of men and that men elected or selected leaders to carry out those laws. Again bottom up. The rest of the world at this time was all top down. All of Europe was divine right of kings, top down. Islam, top down. Uh, Japan, top down. China, top. Everybody else was top down. And here's this one group of uh, pilgrims and Protestants who have a bottom up common law structure. The uh, third pillar uh, more nations had that, and that is private property with written titles and deeds. And the significance of the written titles and deeds is it leaves out almost all of Africa, some parts of Asia, um, which is you cannot grow a business using collateral if you don't have a written title and deed. This is uh, Hernando de Soto's book, The Mystery of Capital. And then the last pillar is a free market economy. Now, when Dave and I wrote this, we thought, okay, that doesn't come till 1776. Wrong. Uh, Plymouth had started the free market economy in 1630 when they created a uh, mill and paid somebody to run the mill while everybody else farmed the, the corn and wheat and so forth and brought it to the miller. So no nation on earth has all four of those from their origin, from their outset. And, and we peg... American exceptionalism, this is very important for the 1619 Project people, we peg American exceptionalism from 1620 and Plymouth, not Jamestown and Virginia, because those people were different. They were Anglicans, top down, okay? They were run by England, 
They did not, the Mayflower, they elect their government right there on the boat. Uh, so uh, Jamestown is not American exceptionalism. Plymouth is, and there, is, there are no slaves in Plymouth. Fascinating. Uh, I was going to get to 1619. I appreciate you bringing it up right away. Uh, these four pillars, they some of them, I'd say three of them, ring common in my ear. Uh, you know, common law, private property rights, and I'm actually going to circle back to common law because it sounds like natural law to me. And then we'll go back to the right. first one. So when you say that the the laws of man were in the hearts, the Germans and then the Eng they thought it was in their hearts. Where did it come from before that, though? Did they they thought it came from their gods, but like uh, Christian gods or pagan gods or how how did that work? The Germans had the Germans had pagan gods. However, this very line is in both the Old Testament and the New Testament where God says, I will write my laws on your heart. Gotcha. So whether or not they were pagan or Christian, it's a common theme, which is the laws, you can divine them. We're, we're divine, ah, wrong word. You can, figure the, you can figure them out. You can sort of reason yes. your, you can reason your way to natural law, to the laws of men. Is that right? Right. And the big difference is that under divine right, which became civil law under Napoleon, which conquered all of Europe under Napoleon and spread to as far as Egypt and all of the colonies, which basically have civil law, um, it's top down. God puts the law in the hand of the king and he tells everybody what to do. And this wasn't changed really officially in England till the Glorious Revolution, when finally it was Parliament that put the crown on William and Mary's heads, not an archbishop or a bishop. Right. You know, I interviewed uh, a one Alexander Dugan, a Russian philosopher, uh, and he uh, and I had a discussion about the United States being the first nation founded where the people had a direct connection to God without an intermediary. Uh, would you agree with that statement? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why, again, Plymouth, and, and uh, the northern colonies are so much more representative of American exceptionalism than Jamestown because they were still Anglican and they were still, you know, the people don't understand that the Anglican church is not a Protestant church. Protestant meaning protesting against some aspect of doctrine. Only thing they were protesting against was Henry's right to have a hottie. Right, right. Anne Boleyn, imagine that what kind of power she had to change the future uh, course of history in such a dramatic way. Uh, shocking, actually, when you think about it. Okay, let's go back to number one. Christian tradition, Christianity in the United States. Uh, I, I, I was raised in very common public schools. Shepar separation of church and state to me was seems to have been taught as a way to keep uh, the church out of government. But as I've been reading, and as I've been reading original texts from the founders, letters to each other, farewell addresses, the notes around state constitutions and their state constitution conventions, which is a huge, amazing resource of information for contemporary thinking around the founding of the, of the federal constitution, uh, is that uh, maybe the church separation of church and state was actually to keep the state out of the church. Uh, it was my my interpretation now is evolving to understand that separation of church and state was meant to create a more perfect church as well as a more perfect uh, uh, government. Uh, is the United States of America a Christian nation? Was it founded by Christians? I have a tweet. It was very carefully worded. It said that the United States was founded by and for Christians and their children so that they can be better Christians and thus better Americans. Now, I got a ton of hate on that because people were reading into it. America is a Christian country. It was founded by Christians. Let's talk this through. What is your interpretation? What have you studied on this? Where do you land today? Has your thought on this changed over time, Larry? What, what do you think? Help me out. Help me understand this. And, and keep in mind, well, I'm not a Christian. So I, I don't really have a horse in this race. I'm just very curious to understand. 
Well, um, I took this up in a particular chapter in What Would the Founders Say? And um, I looked, as you did, at all the state constitutions and so forth. Uh, five of them mentioned Jesus Christ by name. All of them refer to God. Uh, the people who wrote this were virtually all Christians to one degree or another. Um, people who say, well, you know, the founders weren't Christian. The only one who was a deist, a pure deist, was Thomas Jefferson. Benjamin Franklin believed in a interventionist God, but was not a Christian. Uh, George Washington was a devout Christian. There is a book out there called uh, George Washington's Sacred Fire. I quit. It's a huge book. And I quit halfway through because he had made his point so overwhelmingly. I thought there's, there's no sense even going on. Uh, and he pointed out that Washington was a vestry man, prayed in the name of Jesus, frequently took oaths in the name of Jesus. I mean, it's, it's uh, beyond question in my mind. So I would say you're mostly right about your uh, framing of how the Constitution was to protect religion w with one caveat. I think it was meant to protect each state's religion against the religion of another state. Um, Rhode Island was definitely founded to be a Baptist state. Uh, Maryland, even though it failed at this, was founded to be a Catholic state. Uh, Pennsylvania was founded to be the oil, no, uh, the Quaker state. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, and of course, uh, Massachusetts was to be the, the Puritan state. Um, many of the Southern states were Anglican or Presbyterian. And the idea was they didn't want another sect coming in, telling them how to do their Christianity, but they were overwhelmingly Christian and, and they all almost all, even if they weren't Christians themselves, saw their actions in terms of a Christian religion and, and a Christian informed worldview. And I think if you've got your uh, book of readings from Claremont, there's probably one there on, on the uh, Christian elements of the American Revolution. Indeed. Well, it just, it, you can't apparently study the founding without having that message uh, drummed into you over and over and over again. I, I believe it was Washington who said that the return of, what did he call it? Christian gentlemanship. What a phrase. Christian gentlemanship is, he, he said, the return of that was one of the most important uh, parts uh, of the founding. I could be misattributing that. I have certainly been reading all kinds of stuff and maybe getting it mixed up in my head. But I, I do appreciate that explanation. And again, looking at the state constitutions and their contemporaneous conversations really gives you a lot of color into uh, what people's perspectives were when they came uh, to come up with the, the federal constitution. Now, just so that kids out there are clear, what is a deist and how does that separate that person from being a Christian? Okay, great question. Well, a deist is someone who believes there's a God out there somewhere who created the world, and then, then he went to Disney World. He, he just kind of, you know, leaves uh, whatever people do, they do. He does not get involved in the daily affairs of men, which would mean that he doesn't listen to prayer. Um, Franklin was not a deist. He, he was um, a believer that God set everything up, but God could still be persuaded to interfere in uh, the affairs of men for good or for bad. Now, do you, uh, I, and that, that was my understanding, and thank you for making that point clear to everybody else as well. Um, so it's, it's, there is a God, there is a, a power, there is natural law, natural rights, and, and they are given to us perhaps by a, a supreme being of some kind, uh, but he's not necessarily going to get all up in your business every single day, which is, you know, I can, I can understand uh, someone coming to that conclusion. Uh, I personally am on an exploration. I've, I've called myself currently Bible curious. I've been reading the Bible. I'm looking, I'm, I'm, I'm open to it. Uh, I, I understand now more than ever uh, the need for what some people call guardrails, you know, some people call the just the the general moral and and virtuous direction of the citizenry. It seems as though in today's society, education, popular culture, when they say separation of church and state, what they really mean by that is there should be no religion, and like it shouldn't be involved in government whatsoever. And I, be, I feel like that there is a campaign underway and has been for a long time to erase the religious 
uh, underpinnings of the founding and the intentions of the founders. Um, and I, I know as a child growing up, Gen X in the 90s, you know, my take on everything was like, just I want to do whatever I want. I want to be free and I want you to be free to do whatever you want as long as it doesn't impact me. And I, and I thought at that time that uh, setting people up to, to, to be as free as they would like, except, you know, if it touched my nose, right, the famous quip, uh, that that would be enough. But I'm starting to maybe think that freedom isn't uh, to do whatever it is that you would like but rather freedom to do a certain specific type of behavior, to live your life in a certain way uh, that was unavailable to people, which is why they, you know, in revolution or uh, uh, colonial times, which is why they actually came to the United States was to actually express their religion more profoundly, more deeply to live it, to live it in a, a, a more, you know, obvious and public way. Now, how do you do you share that sentiment that maybe I was misled in my education about the separation of church and state and what the purpose was and what the purpose of freedom is like is free the freedom as discussed by the founders wasn't to just go run amok it was freedom to do some things that you ought to do uh right. has there been a campaign to erase that and and am I I'm feeling confused is that you know whose fault is that well, there's definitely been a campaign, but before that campaign started, uh, there's a great essay by Paul Johnson, whom I think is uh, one of the greatest uh, living writers. His book, Modern Times, is probably my number one book. If I had to say what, what, what's the best book that you could send anybody to read, it'd be Modern Times. But he had an essay called God and the Americans, which was a extract or an excerpt from his um, History of the American People. And as he pointed out, um, this wasn't, the founders were here in 1776 and then Jefferson writes his letter and then it all changes. This was a very slow evolution. By, by 1800, uh, many states were still paying ministers. The states were paying ministers. Um, mm -hmm. Justice Story in 1828 says that this is a Christian nation in one of the leading Supreme Court mm -hmm. cases. Um, uh, all the way up until 1898, the, the Supreme Court is referring to uh, America's Christian tradition and so on and so forth. So what happens, as Johnson points out, is as you started to get more sects, S-E-C-T-S for all of you weirdos out there, uh, you, you get the Christian scientists, you get the Seventh-day Adventists, you get the Mormons, uh, you, you get uh, the... Uh, Methodists, the free will Baptists, as, as all these start to come in, um, how do you handle this variety of religious difference in the public square? And Johnson points out that, and this is confirmed, by the way, by a number of religious historians, um, you start to get this transition from a very specific kind of Christian background, i.e. Uh, Puritan uh, in, in the Northeast or Anglican in, in the uh, South to a generic Christianity that can agree on a bunch of moral principles, a bunch of general moral principles. And that becomes what's taught by about 1830 uh, as you start to, to roll forward. So by the time you get to the, the 20th century and the influence of Marx and Darwin and all these other things, um, there has been a significant movement away from a very narrowly defined Christian nation to a much more broadly defined Christian nation that is, is basically kind of a kind of a watered down Christianity because it accepts it accepts almost everything that we can accept without causing a problem. Right. Accept everything that we can accept without it causing a problem, except uh, the causing it a problem part, I think, is changing in that equation and seemingly getting worse. Uh, you know, I struggle with this. I went to George Mason, uh, I studied economics there. I'm well versed in libertarian thinking. They beat it over my head. It was the first time I had heard uh, taxation is theft. The guy was describing it to us, 
you know, as though the 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 modern uh, the, the the genesis for modern government taxation was uh, some some more lord in in the state of nature ran around and killed everybody, took all their stuff, and was like, wait, there's nobody else's stuff left to take anymore. Maybe instead of going around killing them all, I'll just keep them alive and then come by and take a little bit every year. And that's where it all came from. And the guy with such fervor at the podium, this is my freshman year, right? Banging the table, spittle coming out of his mouth. I will never forget that. Uh, so I understand uh, libertarian thinking. And, and I thought that that was it for me. But I have talked to so many other people and seen the consequences of of freedom as running amok versus freedom to do what you ought to do, uh, that I'm personally having issues just trying to discover what that really means, you know, considering the concept of freedom as an avenue to do what I should do rather than when, when you were describing that, when you were describing that guy, the scene of Eli Wallach as the bandito in the magnificent seven, where he was talking about why he doesn't take everything from the townspeople and go, uh, we leave them some of their chicken so they can stay alive next year to give us more stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he seemed to make that case pretty strongly. Uh, but now I'm evolving to understand that that freedom is in, uh, what is the word? Licentiousness, licentiousness. I can't licentiousness. pronounce it. Licentiousness. It's not that, which I'll admit as personally, I, I definitely took a hedonistic approach to life for some time. And, and then it rang, it began to ring really, really hollow. And then you see the consequences of other people doing the same thing. And then I feel an urge. I'm called towards something a little bit greater and I'm exploring that. And I can see how other men throughout history, the greatest men of our nation, the founder, they understood that the calling was to, was to do something better with that freedom rather than to just enjoy themselves. Well, you know, also it's very important to understand when you're reading any of these people, that as humans, we go through phases of our lives. Alexander Hamilton, for example, in, in Cherno's fantastic biography, uh, was very religious as a young man. His, his college roommate remembered Hamilton praying for hours on his knees. Later in life, Hamilton starts to fall away from his religion. And what's odd is he comes back to it right before his death, even though his death was totally unexpected and at quite a young age. So people go through these phases in their lives where they say, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever, you know, Hey, I was in a rock band. I know what that's like. Yeah. Right. Uh, fa fascinating. Um, are you yourself a Christian, sir? I am. And, yeah. and I, I was, uh, raised in the Southern Baptist church and, uh, I kind of gravitated more into a, a Pentecostal, uh, faith. Uh, I, I believe faith works and, and I have enough evidence to show that it absolutely does. And so I, I, I could tell you some minor miracles that have happened in my life who just uh, um, raise your eyebrows. Well, I ask because I want to ask you another question, which is I'm thinking of a quote from uh, Hamilton, which I found to be extremely based. He says, uh, you have to fit the government to the people like you would a cloak to the individual. Now, the implication there is that not everybody around the world is suited to the proposed form of government that they were making at the time. Along with that, there was the assertion that people, uh, you know, Christianity was that uh, set of values and virtues and guidance and morality that we needed in order to uh, have a successful version of this proposed government. But I, again, I am not a Christian, I'm not a theologian, and I don't know any about this history, I'm, so I'm asking a very genuine, basic question here. Is there an element, a universality to Christianity? Like, if you ask somebody, should everybody be Christian? And if so, uh, or if not, are people at various times appropriate for Christianity, not appropriate for Christianity? And the reason I'm asking is how do we square, if there is a universality to it, how do we square a universal notion of Christianity, if it exists, versus fitting the government to the people like a cloak to the individual? I, to me, those seem to be in tension with some sort of conflict. Am I? Help me out. Well, I don't see a conflict there at all. And I do think that God prefers, uh, God's will is that everyone would come to him through Jesus Christ. That, that's, his, that's his will. Uh, the old pygmy in Africa. What about the pygmy in Africa? Hey, it's not my job to decide what happens to the pygmy. You know, I, I'm not getting paid enough to make that decision, right? 
So th that's, that's totally up to God. And we have lots of evidence from the Old Testament that God accounted it to people's faith when they did not know the Messiah, who hadn't come yet. Nevertheless, God accounted it to them for righteousness. So he said, okay, you, you can't know what's coming, so I'm going to make it as though you did, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to chalk this up to your credit. Uh, but Hamilton's comment, I think, is a little bit different than what you imply. I think he's saying that we need to be practical and, and that at the particular time, this is the type of government that would work best with this situation. Um, uh, I would argue that, um, for example, in colonialism, most of the colonies still were not ready for independence. And that was the British view of, we can't give them independence. They're not ready for independence. You know, the British view was they were never gonna be ready because they were never gonna be British. That, that's what they never said. Same thing with the French. Our view is a little bit different. They weren't ready because they had not ever adopted the basics, the pillars that are required to make a republic work. Um, which is an understanding of common law, an understanding of private property with written titles and deeds. And so this is Hernando de Soto's argument in Mystery of Capital. He says, why are there still poor people? Don't they have stuff? You know, George Carlin's famous uh, routine about stuff. And he says, yeah, they got stuff. The problem is they don't have written titles and deeds and they can't prove they've got stuff. So it makes it very hard to leverage. And in Africa, you have all of these tribal claims on land and so forth. Uh, so it's going to be very hard to advance economically if you don't have the right foundations. I mean, over and over again, whether it's a Bible or in common sense, if you don't have a good foundation, you're going to fail. Indeed. And these four pillars of American exceptionalism also happen to be right square in the target of the 1619 project on all fronts, trying to erase the value, uh, erase them from history, tell people that they were all based in slavery and in uh, taking advantage of people and creating systems of oppression, which is why they're, you know, they, they're definitely socialist communist energy infused in there, Marxist for sure. Uh, and a, an assault on private property rights, I'm sure is, is, is it's baked into their ideas. It's it's explicit in their language, uh, and it's obvious in their practice where they would like to take that one day. No surprise that they're coming after these four pillars of American exceptionalism. Now, I, I'm going to make a, a, a sort of a connection here and lead into a next topic for us. In my same readings about uh, the founding and such, there was so much discussion about the establishment of public schools. And that they called for the establishment of public schools in order to create citizens who were virtuous and moral and educated in republicanism in order to cherish it uh, as a religion of the uh, political religion, uh, exceptional American patriotism. Ronald Reagan had a version of Lincoln's uh, political uh, religion, I believe, as well. Uh, and so. These, they, they wanted to start schools to basically, using a, a negative, indoctrinate people into uh, believing that our American system was the best system to have a, a to cherish it, to praise it, uh, to, to oh, damn near worship it uh, and, and advance it with people that were capable of, of functioning within the system. I tweeted about that, too, and I got all these people saying, no, nah, it was the Rothschilds. No, nah, it was the Industrial Revolution. No, nah, they wanted to just make it so that you could follow a schedule or be a good worker. Okay. No, that's that's crap. Right. So let's talk about the, the founders and the ideas at public education. And then I want to home. I want to segue this into state of education today and your efforts in, in homeschooling. Well, uh, Washington talked at length or wrote at length about uh, public education. And, and again, one of the keys to discussing history is you need to put things in the context of the day, which is uh, the, the left always likes to yank things out of the context of the day. Uh, American slavery. Well, everybody had slavery. I mean, we were doing what everybody, why aren't you criticizing them? But we all did the same thing. Everybody's doing the same thing. So um, when you look at public education today, it's, it's critical to understand all of the founders were pretty much self-educated. Uh, they, they may have had a tutor someplace. Um, they, they may have gone to a college, but 
But much of their early education was family education. They were self-educated and they wanted that benefit that they got to be spread to everyone. It, it was one of the, the elements that the Claremont people hate to talk about, which was the equality of the American Revolution, but they wanted everyone to have those same advantages. And we have records of, of boys going to college, to Yale and Harvard at uh, eight years old, nine years old. You know, that they, they would, okay, we've taught you everything we know at home. <laughs> That's our homeschooling for the day. <laughs> Off to Harvard with you. and. Um, uh, it's also interesting to note that, that a, a large number of the founders had gone to divinity school. So uh, again, their notion of what was involved in a public education was a, a way to better your life through knowledge of the things that they, the founders had already received and, and they wanted to share that and B, uh, a reaffirmation as you put it, uh, of the greatness of this nation and the greatness of God and, and how all these things fit together. I wonder what they would say about the state of education today. The part, these arguments that we get today about CRT in schools and, and people pushing back, the left pushing back, how's the government going to get involved in what we're teaching in public schools? And my, uh, my brain just wants to explode. I'm like, hello, it's a public school paid for with public money run by the government. We decide who's in the government. The government runs the schools. How else are we going to decide what is being taught in the schools by yet the, the, by using the government uh, to explain sure. it? Um, I, my, you may not know this, but I, I have ten years working in charter schools. I was executive director of a number of different charter schools. Turned around a few in D.C., some of the worst performing schools in the city, and so I understand the power of education, the value of education, and the current state of affairs in education, which is absolutely pathetic uh to say the least uh in the dmv area here virginia maryland and dc uh, all around us there's these ideas of strip stripping away advanced math keeping everybody in the same place not allowing for exceptional students to make themselves known and be and be educated uh, given extra resources etc fostering gifted and talented sounds like a whole racist scheme and everything at this point now to these folks what is your take on the current state of affairs in public education? What are you doing in terms of homeschooling? Because I know this is a big thing for you, something that you're invested in and passionate about. And use this as a chance to talk about your homeschooling efforts too as well, please. Well, when you mentioned um, the Maryland area, I, I recall this story not too long ago about how I think it was 50% of uh, Maryland high schoolers uh, couldn't pass a basic ma math proficiency test. And I am less concerned. I am concerned, but I am less concerned that exceptional students aren't getting uh, the challenges they need to uh, succeed and, and more than succeed than I am that there are fundamental attacks going on against the very essence of what constitutes education, namely uh, that math itself is racist, that uh, Western the scientific method, which is one of the reasons, as Victor Davis Hanson said, why didn't the Zulus invade England rather than the English invading Zululand? Scientific revolution. Well, that's got to be racist too, because only a small group of people, namely the Western Europeans and the Americans, had that for a very, very, very long time. Why? Goes back to the four pillars. Uh, these kinds of things uh, inform educational, intellectual curiosity and growth and in a foundational way that you can build on, but the only way that you can um, advance is to accept what people before you said, say, okay, that's been proven as a fact, now we're going to move on. If you say from the outset, well, no, no, all math is racist, you will never have anyone, uh, you know, literally get out of a cave, and, and that's what they want. Uh, they, they want absolute uh, ignorance, uh, total docility and, and complete um, subjugation to the government. So uh, I, whoa, 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 I'm not very safe. Can I interrupt you there? You just said you yep. just said uh, subordination to the government. Yeah. Now, what what is the difference there between that and fostering a reverence for our form of government? 
it would come down to what kind of values are you teaching? And if you're teaching a reverence for our form of government, you're inherently teaching a reverence for the idea that there are facts, there are things that are called facts, uh, just because they were stated or invented or, or postulated by white males doesn't make them any less facts. They're still facts. Um, so uh, that's the difference. And it always comes down to that is, is you can't you can't say we're going to have no government as the libertarians want to say. It's you're going to have to make a choice on what government you have. And as I tell parents in these homeschool meetings, uh, I'm not objective. There's no such thing as an objective historian. The, the mere acceptance of this fact over that fact means you've made a value judgment. And, and to me, the key is that of significance. What has affected the largest number of people over the largest period of time? And, and that is what constitutes significance in my view. So you are necessarily going to be talking about kings and queens, industrial leaders, not Howard Zinn's man on the shop floor, because as I like to say, all of Carnegie's employees put together didn't make the same impact on the world that Andrew Carnegie himself did. Right. So what do we do with this then? What do we do with this idea that the, the government sponsored education system in most parts of the United States, certainly anybody taking federal dollars, certainly most, if not all, except for a handful of colleges and universities are now teaching. Not only are they not teaching a reverence for our Republican, not democratic, our Republican form of government as the founders intended when they, you know, suggested in some States compelled in other States to create public schools, um, what, what do we do about that, sir? Well, I think ultimately we've got to do away with most public education, except for those who absolutely cannot afford to go to a private school, a charter school, or be homeschooled. And there will be those people and they are entitled to the very best kind of education we can give them, not the worst kind. But I certainly would, would like to see a majority of Americans homeschooled again, and those who can't be homeschooled going to charter schools. Arizona here, where I am, has a huge charter school uh, uh, structure. I mean, within seven miles of me going up to the freeway, I see three major charter schools. So it's a very big deal here. Homeschooling is absolutely exploding. Um, when I started Wild World of History, which is a history homeschool curriculum back in 2019, I think there were about 5 million uh, homeschoolers. Today, the number is at least 10 million. And this comes from interviews with the two leading homeschool convention sponsors. Um, one of those two, uh, the guy who runs Teach Them Diligently, a guy named David Nunnery, he thinks the number is closer to 20 million. And, and he says one of the reasons is it's very difficult to get data on homeschoolers by, by nature. They don't want to tell the government what they're doing. But also he, he argues that a lot of homeschooling is, is one foot in, one foot out. Maybe they will be taking some classes at a public school or some athletic events, but they won't be fully engaged in, in the public school itself. So what have you done? What is your project like? What is your work like in this area? How can, how can people who are interested in homeschooling be helped out by you? Well, I created a uh, full U.S. and a full world history curriculum. The U.S. is based on Patriots History of the United States, 22 units. I mean, everything that I learned in education school, uh, learning objectives. Um, I walk you right through Patriots History of the United States. We have a separate track for those who are uh, intending to take the AP test and test out of college history with the AP test. We have activities, uh, tests, and then you have me teaching all of Patriots History of the United States in 22 uh, videos, in about 45 minutes to an hour each. World history, same basic uh, structure, except 15 units and 15 videos. So. Um, you're going to get the best U.S. history book out there, Patriots History of the United States, and you're going to get America's history teacher teaching you the book. 
Perfect. That's excellent branding, by the way. And congratulations on that. Guys, if you're interested, if you're homeschooling, if you're thinking about homeschooling, if you want to just augment or replace or battle whatever it is your kids are getting uh, at school, then I suggest you check out Larry's programs. Uh, I know that there is an explosion in homeschooling amongst people in my audience, people that are adjacent to me politically or even in the same, sorry, in the same and even adjacent political sphere. And it's fascinating to me how, man, when I was younger, we used to make fun of homeschooled kids. We thought they were weird, but now I'm realizing maybe they are weird, but weird in a very good way. Weird, weird in a way that seems to almost be an advantage. I know that I spend a lot of my time talking to my kids about what they learned in school that day and then combating it. and giving them some other perspectives. And hopefully I have actually given them a sort of a prophylactic education at the dinner table before they get there to get whatever convoluted message they may be getting so that when they first hear these ideas, they clang off of something that's already inside of their head and gives them a little bit of pause. Um, I wish I could homeschool my kids. My my familiar situation, not as uh, conducive to making decisions like that with the next wife of 12 years at this point. Uh, but I do see the value and folks, I strongly recommend it. There are ways that you can get your kids involved in sports. There are ways that you can get your kids involved in extracurricular activities and hands-on activities, science labs, art projects, all these things, groups, works. You, there, there are sent homeschool centers where people come and engage. So if you have some idea that if you homeschool your kid, he's going to be socially retarded or not able to you know, function in the universe or get socialization, that's not true. That's not true at all. And, and you'll have much more direct control over what they're learning. And you'll be able to get it done in a much faster ma- fashion. And the kids will have more time to do a, a wider variety of things, which is really, and, I and think, part of the power. Jack, Jack, statistics show that uh, these homeschool kids are very good academically, so good that many of the colleges now are seeking to exclude them because they're, they're just too good and, and they don't want them uh, in there. They would rather have public school educated kids. Oh, not as pliable, eh? The homeschoolers, they yeah. think for themselves. And clearly there's economics at work here. Not everyone can take the time. Not everyone right. can be at home. And I understand that struggle. Uh, but man, we have to have a, a national effort to, to minimize the value of materialism and wanting to take that extra vacation and buy those fancy things rather than staying at home and educating your children. Uh, I'm getting married to my longtime girlfriend pretty soon here. And, uh, she is de- already dedicated, a uh, home manager, homemaker, home scheduler. Uh, it is a comprehensive position that occupies all kinds of her time. Uh, and I shudder to think where we would be without it. Uh, so much of what we do would be impossible without having someone at home dedicated full time to managing the kids, three kids, managing the house, managing everything else. Anyway, sort of a side tangent there. Uh, and education. There are so many different ways we can reach the kids. Education is one. Pop culture is another. Now, I remember growing up, Punk rock in the late 80s, early 90s here in Washington, D.C. was a big deal with Fugazi and a number of bands based here in D.C. Then we had the, the, the dance music revolution, rave culture, whatever you want to call it. That, too, very anti-establishment. That's where I really, uh, between those two scenes in D.C. is where I really developed, I think, my anti-establishment perspective. Because uh, back then, to be, to be liberal... You know, to be in favor of a uh, freedom felt like that was the, uh, you know, the contrary position. But today we see that Rage Against the Machine is actually raging on behalf and sponsored by the machine in such a disgustingly ironic way. And I keep asking myself this question, like, where is the dissident art? Where is the dissident music? Uh, you know, for the longest time, music and art was meant to reinforce the establishment all the way up until what? Like, you know, impression, like the, the evolution into impressionism, all, all of classical art was all about reinforcing the establishment and the dominant narratives. Then it became a dissonant thing to do. 
and dissident art and dissident music. And you go to the modern art museums now, and it's all full of political dissident, uh, dissidents. But now that same dissidence is the establishment again. So we sort of come full right. circle that the punks are now the establishment. What do you see? You're a, you are a professional musician. You know these guys. You know the scene and the culture. What is up with music? Why is it establishment? Where are the anti-establishment musicians and artists? What is the role of art to play in resolving these conflicts that we have today? You know, what is your take on the on the role of art, dissidents, current state of affairs, etc.? Well, let's let's remember that Mozart was hardly a, a government guy; that mm -hmm. he was writing, uh, you know, uh, plays and symphonies and stuff against uh, against the man. Um, but okay. but you're right; the the, the Vietnam guys, uh, you know, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young type guys, uh, are now fully fully enthralled to the government. They 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 talk the government line, and thank God for Eric Clapton who came out with with his comments the other day. Um, but but he's few and far between, right? More more of them are like the Foo Fighters, who who say we're, we're going to have an apartheid concert structure here. Um, I don't know. I don't know what happened to the revolutionary fervor uh, of the rock and rollers. Um, one change that has occurred is that um, the new stars are not so much the artists themselves, not so much the Ariana Grandes or the uh, 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 Ed Sharans or these kinds of guys. The new stars are the producers. The producers, like the chain smokers, uh, uh, these kinds of guys are the ones who are driving everything in music. That, that's why, and I'm not criticizing, I like a lot of the modern music, I really do, but but it's why it sounds so much the same. Why, whether it's it's a male vocalist or a female vocalist or a group, it's all within a certain bandwidth of compressed production area that's digital. You've lost all the analog sounds, all the analog ambient noise. Virtually nobody plays live in a studio anymore. That's just, who plays live? I mean, that's, that's crazy. So um, you've gained a great deal in terms of quality in that you can always fix a missed note, but you've lost a huge amount of humanity. And, and I think that fact and playing into these, these producers has probably accounted for some of this loss of, of revolutionary fervor. All underground movements go through phases where they end up getting co-opted by the establishment. Music seems to be in that spot right now. Have mm -hmm. art have have you seen evidence of any anti-establishment dissident music percolating up through the system at this point? A, a little bit. There's a little bit. Part of the problem is how does music get distributed today? Uh, YouTube, Twitter, these kinds of you know accounts where you build a following. Well, who's in charge of those? It's not going to be your dissidents. It's not going to be your people saying, you know, uh, YouTube is crap and you shouldn't you shouldn't support you. It's not going to be those kinds of, of platforms. So they do have a difficulty if they are anti-establishment. I know one uh, one guy um, who has some really good anti-establishment music, but he has a great deal of trouble. Uh, getting it out, and they keep blocking it and kicking it off Facebook and Twitter and all, all these other things. Um, uh, named Poker Face, Poker Face, and uh, they have some great anti-establishment, pro-Trump kinds of stuff. We had very hard to, to get out there. Uh, I recall there were a couple of black conservative rappers who had one of their songs removed uh, from various social media platforms maybe even banned temporarily or permanently. I can't remember their names right now. Sorry, guys. Uh, and and I looked at the the lyrics and compared them to some of the lyrics of like gangster rap and other, even just pop music, which are so lascivious and filled with sex and drugs and crime and misogyny and hate and abuse and all these things. And yet no one bats an eye, well, they used to bat an eye 
But the popular you know, media and the establishment, they don't bat an eye at that. And no one lifts a finger to block any of that. But they did specifically block and ban these guys for their conservative viewpoints coming out in music. And when you're up against a wall like that, where gangster rap, misogyny, hate, drug use, drug dealing is upheld and promoted, but anything contrary to the narrative is demoted and, and D de, you know, promoted and even banned. Uh, that's a, that's a pretty strong signal, uh, coming from the marketplace of, of how you're going to do this. You're going to have, people are going to have to reach out and find the dissident art that they're looking for. And we have to take on the initiative of creating more, creating an aesthetic that people can relate to, creating music that makes sense, that promotes values. Uh, even children's art, you know, Ashley St. Clair just uh, released, a, a, a started a new children's book line, Ta taking some of these cultural uh, issues head on. Um, I and some associates have started a little comic called Lil Chad, where we are taking sort of the peanuts approach or even family mm -hmm. circus, if you want to go back that far, uh, approach mm -hmm. to promoting the values that we hold in dear uh, through uh, simple to observe and, and digest for, for children uh, comics. Guys, if you're out there and you watch, you're looking at a little chat, it's not meant for you. It's meant for the kids. So send it to your nieces and your nephews and your kids and your grandkids and that kid you know down the street. It's not for you, King Giga Chad, guys. So relax about that. That's why it's pedantic and elementary and young based. It feels that way. So the, sorry. Side side note to the critics out there about that. Uh, so I'm 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 very concerned about the lack of dissident art, and I need to just encourage people to reach out and find it and support it in whatever way you possibly can, because without well, Jack, that, don't get, what don't get me started on what on, on the whole. Uh, movie and and culture and the utter cowardice and lack of support from people who have money on the right to get involved in any kind of cultural stuff and, and yes I'm looking at you Mercers that uh, they they bailed on on uh, Milo right or wrong they bailed on Milo at the first sign of trouble um, we need graphic novels I've got a friend Brett Smith who who uh, drew and, and did the artwork for Clinton Cash, uh, has a series of uh, Trump uh, graphic novels out there. We, we need movies. Uh, we need music. Uh, this is not free. This stuff costs money. Leftists have put money into this for 50 years and lost a ton of money knowing they were going to lose money and yet stayed with it because to them, the the message and, and um, what the military used to call preparing the battlefield was far more important than pouring money into a stupid political race. And, and uh, currently, Republican donors are just constantly throwing money into you know, a Kelly Leffler campaign or some nonsense like this, when if they had 10 years ago began preparing the battlefield, these voters wouldn't even be out there now. They wouldn't have to worry about these kinds of races. Um, so uh, I know Amanda has been uh, fighting this battle. I know Nick Searcy ha has been fighting this battle. The, the guys who did Gosnell have been fighting this battle. But, but we, and I have to tell you that for the longest time, maybe 10 years, I would speak to conservative groups and, oh, we don't watch movies. We don't watch television. And I'm going, guys, you, that, that's not the approach. You know, you've got to be involved in this stuff. And, and in my curriculum, for example, I make recommendations for movies, not that you would show a kid the whole thing, but there's a scene in Mel Gibson's Apocalypto where there's uh, 10,000 Indian slaves building a Mayan temple. And all a kid has to do is to see that and go, oh, wait a minute, slavery didn't start in America? See, and, and it's these little things that you don't even need to make a big deal about. They, they seep in and people will see it and understand it. So uh, I tried dipping my toe in this in 2010 we made a, a movie a documentary called rock and the wall um, about how rock music helped bring down the iron curtain and one of our key interviewees was a hungarian escapee former rock drummer named leslie mandoki he got to be a very big music producer in germany i mean uh doing uh the the musical work for audi and volkswagen commercials 
And he got to be friends with, among others, Bill Clinton and Mikhail Gorbachev. Well, Gorbachev visited Leslie in his home in Germany and said, uh, we could keep out books, we could keep out literature, we could keep out movies, but we couldn't keep out rock and roll. And then he said this line, he said, rock and roll was fundamental to bringing down the Iron Curtain. And, and I believe that's true. I, I think that culture can be fundamentally powerful and our side doesn't want to play. Uh, I have been to every single conservative think tank from Heritage to AEI to Cato to Young Americas to Koch Brothers, trying to get them to support a video version of Patriots History of the United States. And every single one of them said exactly the same thing. We don't do videos. I, well, what do you think kids are looking at? Do you think they're going to read your white papers? Well, we put Ben Shapiro on college campuses. I go, great, he'll get 300 people. I did a video for Prager University called um, uh, uh, America's Socialist Origins, got over 1 million views. Which is your best use of money? That's quite a hornet's nest to kick over there, my friend. Uh, I agree 100%. And uh, there is a certain sclerosis among conservative donors and think tanks. They are stuck in another time. They are arrogant and snobby and think that they don't need to get involved in things like music or art or movies or things on the ground or do grassroots work in this respect. This influence, this persuasion work, this cultural building. You would think that they could look to the slow march through the institutions and realize that this is a long game that needs to be played. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe they don't actually give a fuck about what's happening. Maybe they're just interested in supporting the unipar the uniparty, the corporate party and maximizing GDP growth and maximizing stock returns and maximizing the size of their portfolio than they really are about making change in our culture. Culture obviously influences our government, Andrew Breitbart, culture downstream or everything downstream from culture, politics downstream from culture. Uh, I believe that I am not surprised at all to hear somebody report that rock and roll helped bring down the Berlin wall. Not surprised by that at any rate. Um, I've got a story for you, Jack. And this tell was, me if there, if there was one story that epitomized rock and the wall, rock and the wall it was this one. Uh, one of our stars was a, an Atlanta band, a black band. They have one white player, the, the guitarist uh, called mother's finest. I used to play on the same circuits with Mother's Finest. We'd finish in a club on Sunday night and they'd start on Monday night. So I, I got to know them pretty well. And they're still playing today. I mean, they're, I don't want to tell you how old they are, but you know, they're my age and they're, they're still out there rocking. They're awesome. Well, they played East Berlin two weeks before the wall fell. And when they went over their tour bus, they had to stop at Checkpoint Charlie. And uh, Glenn, the uh, lead singer and manager said that, uh, the, the Germans get under the bus with the mirrors and check things out, make sure you're not smuggling anything in. They come on with the dogs and check everything out. And then he said um, a German officer with the, the big coat with the buttons and everything and the epaulets, he comes on and he goes, who is the leader here? And, and Murdoch kind of raises his hand because he's afraid he's going to get shot. He says, to the back of the bus. And they go back where they can draw the curtain, you know, and now Glenn's really concerned. He, he really thinks he's going to get shot. And he goes, shh, you tell no one. Shh. He opens his jacket and pulls out a Mother's Finest album. Get out of here. And he says, you, would, you will sign and everyone else will sign. And, and he brought them all back to sign this album. He goes, now, shh, I have the next album next time you come through. Does See. that say it all? It really does that. So we need these vectors. Okay. Memes are effective, you know, and the kids speak in memes and we make memes in the liminal order. My all men's group, 700 strong around the world. We do memes. We do public uh, social media campaigns. We've created this comic Lil Chad follow on Twitter at Lil Chad 10. Uh, check my uh, Twitter feed also for that. Also on Instagram, Lil Chad. Um, we got to do more of it. We got to do more of it and we have to take more of an activist approach. Okay. Um, I have a question for you that I've been posing to other people as well. 
conservatism as a movement was pitched as a movement of ideas. I remember this being very clearly written in the late 70s and early 80s, thinking ideas will win out in the end. Is conservatism still a movement of ideas? If so, what new ideas do they have? If not, what should the new approach be? I have my own take. I'm curious as to what you think. Well, any movement to have any uh, success at all has to be a movement of ideas. But it can't only be a movement of ideas because the ideas will not go anywhere. We are seeing right now how our ideas are excluded from the public sphere, whether it's Yahoo or Twitter or Google or whatever it is. And, and so you have to be able to be active enough with, with your I ideas. I mean, Jesus had a message, but then he tells the 12, go forth and tell everybody this message, right? And, um, and so I think for too long, conservatives have just thought, well, we have the better ideas, they will win. They won't win if nobody gets to hear them. And that was sort of the point of rock and roll. Reagan understood this. Reagan said, uh, grudgingly, because he wasn't a rock and roll fan, he liked the Beach Boys, but he wasn't a rock fan. But he says, we're gonna blast rock and roll into the, the Eastern European countries through Voice of America and Radio Free Europe. And, and they had a big debate about this. And some people said, well, that, that music's not, not fitting to send them. We need to be sending an opera. And they, no, no. If you want to affect the kids, you better be sending in what the kids are listening to. And uh, one of the uh, issues that I think conservative artists have is that they, they've got to understand how to get that edge, that same edge that, that the left has without compromising the, the uh, goodness of their ideas. Right. If you have to kind of go undercover and take a vector to get into somebody's brain, don't dilute the message or lose really what the right. ultimate goal and the purpose of the message was. Um, I, I think that conservatism as a movement of ideas, like you said, there are concepts, but it needs to be about action. So little action seems to be taking place. And, and in fact, from David French and others on the right, it seems that they have been swallowed up by the ideas of the left and are even taking action uh, to people towards their right now. Um, we need what I called a critical conservative theory, right? The critical part of critical race theory and critical theory in general is that, that, that philosophy without activism is nothing. It's worthless. You have to take action. You have to make change in the institutions. That's the approach that we need. But man, are we, we're like 40 or 50 years behind the ball in terms of taking action. Larry, last question. If you had magic wand and you were in charge of everything and everybody, and you wanted to see, you know, what, first of all, what would your outcome be? What would you like to see change and how would you go about doing it? I'm, I'm very interested to see what your overarching strategy would be to, to resolve the problems that you've identified and in what capacity and how do we move forward? What is your prescription? Okay, well, let me take just two areas, culture and education. In terms of culture, I would see a pool of very wealthy conservatives uh, just run amok funding uh, graphic novels, music, movies. Even if they lose money, understand you're probably going to lose money. That's not the point. The point is to get the message out. Get it out, get it out, get it out, get it out, get it out. The Bible says faith comes by hearing not having heard, hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. And so you've got to keep hearing these messages in order to understand what your, your, your movement is all about. Um, in terms of education, I would see a, a massive groundswell. Uh, I would view it as a two-step method, one to charter uh, free market kinds of schools away from public schools, then to more homeschooling. So I'd have a three-tier system, homeschooling for most people, uh, charter schools for those who, who can't homeschool, and then public schools, good public schools, for those who absolutely can't afford to go to a charter school or don't have the family situation uh, to homeschool. So those would be my two biggest uh, reforms. 
Right. And you didn't say anything about uh, a new law or a new government initiative or a specific candidate or anything like that, right? No. And I, th I think you may need to block some things like block the teaching of CRT, things like that. But you don't need to mandate. I'm, I'm not all that big on mandating teaching free market economics. If you just have a, a course that teaches basic economics, uh, honestly, you can't help but be a free market advocate. Indeed. So I love the fact that when given a magic wand, you're not talking about getting DeSantis elected or vetoing this bill or getting out of Afghanistan or whatever. It's about starting full circle here, guys. Man, you'd think I put effort and planning into these things. Full circle. It comes all the way back to reinforcing the four pillars of American exceptionalism, starting with the people and the children creating the guardrails, the culture, the environment that create the kind of people that flourish within the system that we've created. And in the absence of that, what we find are people who are opposed to the form of government that we have created, have created all their own oughts and shoulds, and they're telling everybody what they ought and should do. And they are rising in power and have taken over institutions and media and culture and absolutely everything that we used to hold dear that gave us meaning and purpose and power in our life because we stood back and we're like free markets, free society, blah, 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 freedom, freedom, freedom. All these people, they rise up and what is their message? It's anti-freedom. It's anti-freedom. It's, it's hilarious. It would be hilarious in it's irony if it wasn't so sad because we're all living it. And the American experiment is certainly, uh, under siege at the moment. Larry, Anything else you'd like to get in here before we wrap up? This has been a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, I didn't tell you about how I almost burned down the Yuma Convention Center. <laughs> ah, you want to end on that one? Sure. Tell us. Um, we were opening for the James Gang. Um, uh, Joe Walsh had just left, and Tommy Boland, great guitarist, but he couldn't sing like Joe could, had come in. And I was just pioneering a flaming drum solo where we would – uh, stick timpani mallets in a uh, in lighter fluid, basically. This is our first take at this. And the idea was that the lights would go out, and I had these two big bass drums, <laughs> and my singer would go backstage and, and squeeze out, this is the important part, squeeze out the mallets and then light them on fire and hand them to me. Meanwhile, the other guys in the band would be wiping down all my cymbals with more flammable goo, right? Corky was so excited when the lights went out, he forgot to squeeze the mallets out. Oh my God. So he lights them and he hands them to me. And I do the big rock pose, you know, the Jack Black pose. And I'm just going to hit one symbol. Now, I always use this to talk to kids about a, a, a message, how you can succeed in life by, by doing something that's very easy and making it look hard, <laughs> which is basically what a lot of magicians do. I mean, yeah, they have skill with their tricks, but basically it's all about, oh, look at all this. Oh, the dancing girls. Oh, the smoke. The fire. A pigeon. Oh, man, that's, that's wild, right? So you can take something that looks very, uh, that's very easy, but make it look hard, or pull a Michael Jordan, which is take something that's very hard and make it look easy, which is you fly through the air and you go over 16 people and you dunk, you know, and, and that's it. So I wasn't that great a drummer. I was okay. But so I took method one. And so I was just going to hit one <laughs> symbol here and, and set that one on fire. Right. So boom. And, and it looked like the Mekong Delta. I mean, it was apocalypse. Now there was flame shooting across the stage and they're running out there with fire extinguishers and they're stomping out guitars that were on fire. And I realized Corky had forgotten to stamp out to squeeze out the mallets. And I'm yelling at him, Corky. And he's going, yeah, man, yeah. And, and so now I hit a symbol over here and some Mekong Delta on that side of the stage. And now people are getting worried. You know, you're going to burn down the whole convention center. I think there are like 5,000 people in it at that time. So I try to roll around. I had this huge set. I try to roll around all these drums, set them all on fire. I'm totally surrounded by this wall and the audience is going nuts because they're sensing you're going to have a human sacrifice, right? 
and, <laughs> and finally I was able to do a roll on the snare drum fast enough to put it out, you know, and that you could tell the audience there was just kind of this little, uh, okay, all right, all right, yeah, yeah, that, that was really great. So we fixed it after that, but I, I, it came close there to starting a major fire in a, in a major convention hall throwing fire across the stage i think that's exactly the metaphor that we need for right now we need to set some things on fire we need a phoenix to come rising out of the ashes at 1619 is starting to bury us under right now larry i really appreciate your time today guys if you haven't got it it is a wonderful resource a patriot's history of the united states from Columbus's Great Discovery to America's Age of Entitlement by Larry Schweikert and Michael Allen, 15th anniversary edition, number one New York Times bestseller, half a million copies in print. Congratulations on that continued success. Also, please check out for Larry uh, the wildworldofhistory.com. You can also reach them on Twitter at history underscore wild. Larry, thanks so much for giving me some context and helping me answer questions that I had. I really appreciate it. Guys, if you like this, which I know you did, please, please share it. Please like it. Please send it out. Please tweet it. You know the algorithm is working against us. The only way that we can actually overcome it is by physically sharing this with each other. So please get that out there. Follow me on Twitter at Jack Murphy Live everywhere else. Stay tuned. Lots of great shows coming up, everybody. August is a little bit light. It is the summer months. We'll be doing a bunch of traveling, but come September, we are going full speed ahead with two shows a week and lots of clips every single day at noon. Podcast release uh, on Mondays at 12 p.m. on all the typical outlets. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, everybody else. And with that, we are out. On this show, we're driven by curiosity. We want to chart a path forward. Best people, best conversations. We're on a journey and it's just getting started. 